When prosperous lawyer Francis Blandy died in 1751, his daughter Mary was immediately arrested and charged with his murder. But was she actually a cold-blooded murderer? Or just a simple love-struck girl tricked into unintentionally poisoning her own father? Mary was born in 1720 and grew up in a house on Hart Street near Henley Bridge here in Oxfordshire. She grew up as the only child of Francis Blandy and Mary Stevens. The family were well liked and respected by the local gentry. Francis was a lawyer whose skill saw him rise to not only become a person of some importance in the county, but also quite wealthy. His wife was described as an emblem of chastity and virtue. Graceful in person, in mind elevated. And Mary, who got her name from her mother, seemed to share these qualities. Mary was a clever, intelligent child who eventually became a well-mannered and well-educated young woman who had the ability to charm everyone she met. So it would be no surprise that many men vied for her attention. This number would only have swelled upon learning that Francis had set a dowry for his daughter. A dowry is a sum of money or property that the man who would become her husband would inherit upon marriage. Rumour had it, it was set at £10,000, an astronomical amount for the time. And so it was no surprise that many men approached Francis to ask for his daughter's hand. However, he found none of the suitors deserving of his daughter. That was until 1746, when Mary met Captain William Henry Cranston, a first lieutenant of Sir Andrew Agnew's regiment of Marines. While Francis had turned away soldiers before, and while this man was both unattractive and impecunious, Cranston was also the son of a Scottish nobleman, and thus, in Francis's opinion, worthy of Mary. When Captain Cranston then formally asked for his daughter's hand the following year, Francis was more than happy to give his blessing. He even invited William to live in the family home. Things seemed to be progressing well, but there was one slight issue. William Cranston was already married. One of Mr. Blandy's acquaintances was Lord Mark Kerr, who also happened to be Cranston's great uncle. When he heard the news about Mary and William's plans to marry, he wrote a letter to Francis, letting him know that his daughter's lover already had a wife, a woman named Anne Murray, and a child living in Scotland. As you may guess, this revelation left Mr. Blandy outraged and ready to throw the deceiver out of his home. Yet Cranston was able to convince Mary and her mother that his marriage was just a misunderstanding and would soon be annulled by the Scottish courts. Whether it was her love for William or her fear that she would become a spinster, Mary decided to stand by her betrothed. In the spring of 1748, Cranston travelled to London where he was to stay till the unhappy affair with his Scottish spouse was legally terminated. In the meantime, he and Mary maintained a passionate correspondence. However, the lovers suffered a significant setback on March the 1st, 1748, when the commissary court decreed William Henry Cranston and Anne Murray were legally married. The deceitful husband was ordered to pay an annuity of £40 sterling for his wife and £10 for their daughter, causing Cranston, who was already strapped for cash, to fall into an even deeper financial crisis. Still, Mary's mother believed that the captain and her daughter were meant to be, even pleading with her husband to give them his blessing on her deathbed. Francis, however, had already concluded that Mary's Scottish suitor was more trouble than he was worth, and he had to go. At this point, Cranston informed Mary he had devised a plan to deal with her father's disapproval. 
He told her of Mrs. Morgan, a cunning woman known to him in Scotland, from whom he had received a certain powder. Cranston assured Mary that if she would mix this so-called love powder into something Francis ate or drank, his attitude towards her suitor would change from antipathy to affection. It is unclear if Mary believed what she was told or if she knew what was going on from the start. Nevertheless, she was desperate enough to try anything to be able to marry the man she loved. In November 1750, Cranston returned to Scotland as his mother, according to him, had fallen extremely ill. With him, Cranston carried a generous amount of money given by Mary to help with his expenses. As she waved goodbye and watched her lover disappear into the distance, Mary could not have known it was the last time she would ever see her fiancé. In May of 1751, Cranston sent Mary a supply of the supposed love powder, along with instructions to mix the powder in tea. Mary did as she was instructed, also adding some of the powder to her father's food, and soon after, Francis Blandy became terribly sick. He began suffering from severe stomach pain, vomiting, and weakness. Curiously, the same thing happened to the family maid and charwoman. This would later be put down to them both eating some leftovers from Francis's meal. Despite those around her falling ill, it's said that Mary was blissfully unaware that this was down to her love powder. Her father grew increasingly ill to the point where Mary was forced to send for a local doctor. When she informed them of her actions, it didn't take them long to find the root cause of Francis's suffering, and they informed Mary that she may be found responsible for his poisoning. Fearful of possible repercussions, she burned the love letters sent to her by William along with what remained of the powder. However, a maid named Susanna Gunnell managed to rescue some of the powder from the flames and send it to a chemist for testing. There, the love powder was found to be arsenic. Knowing that her father was not long for this earth and that she was the cause of his demise, Mary begged him for forgiveness. She told him about William's plan and the love powder, which she now knew was anything but. Despite knowing that his death was near, Francis found it within himself to forgive his daughter, even telling her not to speak of the poisoning so as to hopefully avoid arrest. This wasn't to be. Widely suspected of the poisoning, Mary soon found herself confined to her room, and on August the 14th, 1751, Francis Blandy succumbed to his illness. Distressed by this news and finding the door to her room open, Mary escaped and ran through the town, though she soon found herself chased by a mob of people before finding refuge in a nearby pub. She would later claim that this was not an attempt to escape, but her simply acting upon the distress she felt. Whether it was an escape attempt or not, Mary was returned home and placed in irons before being transferred to Oxford Jail to await trial. Of note, the irons can be seen in several illustrations from the time. Her trial took place on February 29, 1752 at Oxford Assizes, and it's said that Mary gave a characteristically intelligent and zealous defense of herself. She denied having poisoned her father, stating her belief that the powder was a love potion. The trial was also notable as it was one of the first times an expert had been put before the jury to explain forensic evidence. This was Dr. Anthony Addington, who had run the tests on the powder, revealing it to be arsenic. His evidence, along with that of several other witnesses, was enough to ensure Mary was found guilty of murder, going on to receive the mandatory sentence of death. On April the 6th, 1752, she would meet her fate in the yard of Oxford Castle Prison. 
Her gallows consisted of a wooden beam between two trees. As she was led to them, she asked the officials, for the sake of decency, gentlemen, don't hang me high. Upon the scaffold, draped in black, a noose was placed over her neck, hands tied in front of her to allow her to hold her prayer book. Once she had finished reading, she dropped the book, which was a signal for the hangman to drop her to her death. For most, this is where Mary Blandy's story ends. But over the years, decades and indeed centuries since her execution, there have been reports of Mary's ghost being seen at several locations around Oxfordshire, Berkshire and Buckinghamshire. Among the locations is, perhaps unsurprisingly, Blandy House, once home to the Blandy family. It is now a dental practice where several ghostly sightings have certainly been enough to make some say, ah. It's claimed Mary's ghost has been seen walking through the rooms beside the river and standing beneath a mulberry tree in the garden. As for Captain Cranston, upon learning that Mary had been arrested and that Francis's entire fortune was less than half the 10,000 dowry he had been promised, he fled the country to France. There, his health rapidly deteriorated and in November of 1752, he passed away. His wife and child inherited some 1,500 pounds. Right then, thank you for watching. Take care, and I'll see you next time with another story to make you say, well, I never.